Welcome back to another Swordmaster Publications presentation. I'm Ernie Lawrence. Tonight we're going to be studying Deuteronomy chapter 12. Uh, there's two parts to this um, that kind of intertwine as we go along. Moses is going to get into the commandments that he's been kind of leading up to in the first 11 chapters. He's going to tell the uh, the Israelites their duty, their Deuteronomy. Um, that's what the, the book is named after. And um, the, the two intertwined things are, number one, don't go in and worship these other false fake gods, but completely eradicate them from out of the land. Uh, every vestige of the religion needs to be gone from the land so that they don't follow after it. And the other part, uh, Moses isn't going to actually say the word temple, um, and he's not going to be specific about the temple, but he is going to allude to the temple and to um, this location where they're supposed to come and uh, offer their worship before God because that's the place that he's going to uh, kind of make his presence uh, known within the land. So uh, let's go ahead and get started in Deuteronomy chapter 12. And we're going to start here in verse 1. It says, These are the statutes and judgments which you shall observe to do in the land which Jehovah God of your fathers give you to possess it all the days that you live upon the earth. Now, uh, the word land and the earth there are um, related concepts, but they're two different words. The first word land is eris, uh, and the second land or the second word uh, for earth there is adama, um, and both of them can mean the land, the ground, the the place that you dwell, uh, those kinds of things, a place that you till or plant crops or raise raise cattle and things like that. Um, so the words are synonymous terms, <clears throat> and uh, the way that they're they're both being used here is to talk about this local uh, region that God has promised to them and given to them. And so it's important to understand uh, in this context when we're talking about Israel that the word earth that is translated from Adama or Eris or uh, Geh, which we get geo from, um, like geography and, and whatnot in the Greek, <clears throat> um, these can and often do relate to this specific localized area. So when we talk about a new heavens and a new earth later on, we don't have to be talking about a whole brand new planet. In fact, in Second Peter 3, when he talks about the destruction of the earth uh, or the destruction of the world by uh, the flood, talking about the, the whole surface being covered by the flood, um, he wasn't actually talking about the destruction of what we think of when we think of the word planet, which is the whole sphere all the way down to the core. But uh, it's actually referring to the people who who dwelt in the land uh, at that time. It was it was a complete wiping out of all humanity on the surface without an actual destruction of the planet itself. So um, <clears throat> keep in mind, context is very, very important in understanding what these words mean. So here, land and earth, uh, Eris and Adama uh, mean the same thing they're they're talking about the promised land in this context it says in verse 2 you shall utterly destroy all the places wherein the nations which you shall possess serve their gods upon the high mountains and upon the hills and under every green tree so again we're going to talk about <clears throat> these high mountains these hills and, and these groves a lot especially when the kingdom splits when they go to the north uh, the northern tribes don't feel like they can come down to Jerusalem and worship anymore because they're not that you know Jerusalem's part of the southern kingdom, and they're divided, and they they are at odds with each other, and so they set up high mountains and and groves and all of these places. They kind of resurrect them uh, in the ten northern tribes, <clears throat> and it becomes a problem. It leads them astray, and and uh, they end up under wicked kings all the way down and are destroyed for it. Verse 3, and you shall overthrow their altars and break their pillars and burn their groves with fire. And you shall hew down the graven images of their gods, destroy the names of them out of that place. So they're, they're, they're supposed to get rid of all of the false fake religions. America prides itself on its freedom of religion. And people have, have twisted the original intent of what that meant and if you go back and read the founding fathers of um, America you would understand that the freedom of religion that they intended was the freedom to worship Jehovah God as you saw fit there was never any intention 
and they spoke specifically um, against the Mohammedan religion um, that, that is called Islam. Um, they, they spoke very vehemently against it, that it should not get a foot a foothold here in America. They were they were not expecting the First Amendment to be interpreted that way because in their day, in their context, they understood and, and didn't think it needed to be spelled out. It was something that needed to be spelled out. And I've I've mentioned it multiple times uh, in these videos, multiculturalism destroys destroys a nation. And that's true of, of religion as well. If you have um, groups, and we see this, we, we see this uh, with the people who, um, if, 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 if it worked out the way that it's said it's supposed to work out today, that, that freedom of religion means that everybody can practice their own religion however they see fit, and everybody just left each other alone, then... If that was the intent of the founders, which I don't believe it was, but if that was the intent of the founders and that's actually how it worked out, then you're probably going to have <clears throat> relative peace for religions who tolerate one another, who, who can just say, okay, I'm going to try to convince you through my words, through uh, preaching or whatever, but I'm not going to force you to do anything um, I think you would you would have relative peace, but probably a slow dec decline towards you know whatever the the non moralistic religions. Uh, atheism is a religion. Uh, paganism is a religion. Um, you've got Satanism is out there and alive and kicking. Uh, you've got all of these uh, anti moral or amoral. Uh, they they call themselves amoral uh, religions. And what ends up happening is uh, they don't tolerate one another. They ultimately don't tolerate one another. And you're going to have the, the so-called Christians, the, the denominational folks out there, will, will try to be loving. And, and then they'll have that used against them. They'll say, you know, Christ, you know, God is love. And you should just tolerate everybody when everybody else out there is not tolerant of anybody. Um, you know, the Muslims will kill you. If if they're if they believe they have enough control to do so, they'll kill you if you don't if you don't convert, uh, or they'll make you pay a very heavy tax. Um, but eventually, they'll kill you. <clears throat> uh, atheism will mock you and and use every law they can against you. Uh, we've seen them take over the schools. We've seen them uh, teaching things like evolution, which is scientifically absurd in terms of physics, um, but also incompatible with with scripture. Um, you have paganism, which is obviously uh, is something that just isn't uh, compatible with Christianity. And so you have, you, you have all of these religions, you, you know, that bumper sticker coexist. That's, that is a, an absurd, ridiculous thing because those religions are intolerant of each other by their very natures. You, 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 when you dig down into those religions, they cannot tolerate one another. And so um, the, the idea of freedom of religion is one that ultimately will destroy the nation because one is going to use it against the others. And that's what's happened. We, we've seen Satanism moving in and, and trying to get uh, um, statues to Moloch and, and to uh, all of these uh, different pagan gods put up uh, and you, you've seen uh, atheism come in and, and say freedom of religion means freedom from religion and we're going to remove God from the schools and stuff and so you have this intolerance because multiculturalism doesn't work and when America and I, I, again I've said this before when America moved away from melting pot into a mixing pot and we just tried to, to tolerate everybody but everybody was separate uh, we moved away from being a, 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 a nation founded on Judeo-Christian principles, on, on biblical principles. When we moved away from that and just started saying, we're going to tolerate everybody, America began its decline, and here we are. And this isn't, this isn't a surprise to anybody who has read the Bible and understands the Bible. This isn't a surprise to... The people who are not Christians, they're doing it on purpose. 
multiculturalism is the death knell to a nation. It destroyed Rome. It destroys uh, every nation historically that goes in that direction because you are going to have the kind-hearted, peaceful, tolerant, good guys who try to give ground and compromise and, and do all of the, the, the nice things that they're shamed into doing and nobody else is doing that. Nobody else is giving ground. Nobody else is trying to be tolerant. Nobody else is doing what they're demanding of the nice guy. And so eventually the nice guy gets crowded out until there's nothing but, but the, the intolerant people left. And you can look at politics. You can look at, at religion. You can, you can look at any of this stuff. And you can see from what God has said here to Israel the path that every nation will take. And so if we understood freedom of religion to be the government can't tell you how to worship Jehovah God and, and the government can't make laws to because they were definitely in the context of, of uh, the Anglican Church and the King of England and demanding uh, the other denominations worship that way and, and using the rule of, of the government, the authority of the government, the power of the government to force that, if we understood it in that context and we understood freedom of religion in that context, then America would still be the nation that lived more on the biblical principles and the other religions of the world would not be tolerated in terms of allowing them to overwhelm Christianity and remove Christianity from everything. And and we don't understand that. It hasn't been taught that way in, in 70 years. Nobody teaches that the Constitution was founded on biblical principles anymore. Nobody understands that in, in this day and age that is younger than me. Um, and it's, it's in fact illegal, or if not, I say illegal, maybe not against the law, but against the unspoken law. Like if you teach that in a public school, you can get fired, you lose your job for it. And so multiculturalism has slowly crept in and is, it has brought our nation to where it is, to the brink of collapse. That's where we are, the brink of collapse. God is telling Israel here in Deuteronomy 12, Moses is saying, you go in and you utterly destroy all of those fake false religions and don't go down that path. Don't worship them. Don't, don't follow after them because they will be your destruction. And, you know, somebody might say, well, you're getting up on your high horse. You're, you're getting into politics. You're getting into things outside of what the Bible is actually saying. If we try to isolate the Bible from our lives and we try to say, well, this is, this is the lesson and we're going to understand this in isolation, but we don't get that this is God's message to mankind and we don't understand that this is the nature of mankind and we are men, then we're missing the point. This is not something that we're, we're studying on just a, an isolated scholarly level here. We're trying to get the message so that we can bring others to Christ and ultimately take as many people to heaven with us as we can. That is the reason we are here. And so, yes, I'm going to talk about it, and I'm going to talk about it in a way that people will get it without any kind of... Um, uh, like, I don't, I don't want to beat around the bush. I don't want to be unclear. I don't want to, I don't want to say things where people don't understand what I'm saying. I, I'm going to come out and I'm going to be straight about it. I want, I want to be very, very clear about what I believe that God is saying here so that people get the message. And if, if people get the message, then whatever they choose to do with it, that's on them. That's not on me. They, they, they can hate me, love me, whatever, as long as they clearly got the message. Because then it's their responsibility to act accordingly. And so that's why I say the things that I do. I'm, I'm not here to win friends. I'm not here to gain subscribers, although that's great because that means the message is getting out to more and more people. I'm here to, to teach what I believe to be the truth.
That is my number one priority. Nothing else comes even close to that. I, I could have zero subscribers. I'm still going to teach the same thing. It's just that, that's just the way that it is. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna um, tiptoe around what God is very very clear and very very hard on teaching. I mean, He's telling them go in and take out these nations, completely remove them from the land. That's that's not a that's that's not a, a soft, easy. I mean, look at what we've talked about with like Numbers thirty one. There are some hard things that God is calling for Israel to do. And one of those is no multiculturalism. You do not keep their cultures in your land. You wipe them out. You do what I command you to do. And if we did that as a nation, <clears throat> I believe that America would, would remain the best nation on the planet for as long as we did that providentially, providentially speaking. I, I believe that 100%. We're not doing it, and here we are. All right, so he says, go in and overthrow those. And then verse 4, he says, you shall not do so unto Jehovah your God. So whatever I'm, Moses is saying, whatever you're doing to those other fake false gods and their religions and everything about them, you're not going to do that to Jehovah. You keep you keep worshiping Jehovah. And then we get into this idea of the temple that is being alluded to. But unto the place which Jehovah your God shall choose out of all your tribes to put his name there. Okay. So this is, this is, we know this ultimately is the temple. It's not said that here specifically, but we know that this is the temple. The place where Jehovah God shall choose out of all your tribes to put his name there, even unto his habitation, his dwelling place. His dwelling place was going to be among them in a, a, a type manner. Obviously, God is omnipresent. To say that God is only in this one place is silly. But in a representative, typological fashion, God's presence, his habitation, would be in this place. This is what we know to be the temple. And he says, and there you shall come. And then we see this as, as the antitype in the church. So, no, there's only one place. There's only one place that Jehovah God is going to come under the mosaical law they're going to build this temple he's been wandering around with them in the tabernacle all this time but eventually god's going to say this is my place this is where i'm going to be you build me a temple here and i will dwell among my people in the temple then we come to the new testament how many temples are there there's only one there's only ever one place where god dwells but that temple is the church and the church is the people it's not a building it's not a, a place made with hands we are the stones built up to a temple. Paul says that in several places, First Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians. There's a number of places where <clears throat> the church is called the temple of God. There's only one. It's not this crude matter. Our physical bodies, we, we get old, we get sick, uh, we're frail, we die. That's not the temple of God. The temple of God is the church, the bride, the unspotted, perfect um you know, the the kingdom, all, all of those terms referring to a singular organization. And then God says, those that keep my commandments, John 14, 23, Jesus said that I and the Father will come and make our abode, our dwelling place, our habitation with them. And that's not a location, that's with a group of people. We will make our habitation with them. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. It is within you. And so understanding this chapter right here and all of the other chapters that talk about the temple helps us to understand the nature of the church. God said, there's going to be a place, the place, singular one, that I shall choose. God chose the church. Man doesn't choose the church. God chose the church. There's only one church that he chose. All the rest are fake false. They're all man-made, worthy of being cast into the fire. Out of all of your tribes to put his name, his name represents his power and authority. What do we see about Jesus and his name? Those who call upon his name, those who invoke his authority, 
He's going to put his name there, even unto his habitation, his dwelling place. Shall you seek? You have to come to the temple. God doesn't just save you universally. He doesn't. There, you can't just worship anywhere you want to. All these people. Oh, I'll just, I'll just worship in my home. God, will, God will love me anyway. Oh, I'll just, I'll just choose the church of my choice. I'll worship, I'll, I'll worship over here on this hill, and I'll worship under these trees. That's exactly what it is. <clears throat> when you say you're going to worship God your way, that you can worship God anyway, then you are rejecting. And, and at the best, misunderstanding, if not willfully rejecting what God has said about his temple. God says, you shall come, you shall seek and come to the temple, to the place where I dwell. Where does God dwell in the New Testament? He dwells in the church. And you have to come to that church, that bride, that temple. To worship God and be acceptable to him. If you don't, if you go to the church you chose instead of the one that God chose, then your worship's not acceptable. It's in vain. In vain do they worship me. Teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. And that's that's what we should be getting out of this. The type any type relationship is very, very clear. Verse 6, and you shall there bring your burnt offering and your sacrifice and your tithes and your heave offerings of your hand and your vows and your free will offerings. Calvinists, free will. Your free will offerings and the firstlings of your herds of your flock. And there you shall eat before Jehovah your God and you shall rejoice in all that you put your hand unto, you and your household wherein Jehovah your God has blessed you. So he says, <clears throat> bring all of your sacrifices to this place. And eat with joy. It's a celebration. Worshiping God is a celebration. And they were to do it where he chose to do it. The way he said to do it. Not the way we want to do it. Not the way that makes us feel warm and fuzzy in our hearts. There, there, there's a, a backwards way of, of saying, I'm going to do what makes me feel good. Instead of saying, I'm going to do what God said, which doing it God's way is what makes us feel good. By doing it God's way, because we're doing it God's way, we should feel good about that. But if we say, I'm just doing it because it's about me, I want to feel good, that's selfishness. That's not, that's not God-centered, that's self-centered. Then you're doing it wrong. Even if you're actually doing the right thing, if you're doing it because you want to feel good... And it's about you. You're doing it wrong. Even if you're doing the right action, you're doing it for the wrong reason. But if you're doing the wrong action to feel good, you're certainly not worshiping God in spirit and in truth. And there you shall eat before Jehovah your God, and you shall rejoice in all that you put your hand unto, you and your household, wherein Jehovah your God has blessed you. So they were going to celebrate all the blessings that God had given them to, <coughs> or given to them, all of the work that they had done. Um, that God had commanded them to do, um, you know, this <laughs> for them to go out and to till the land and to, to worship God the way he said and, and to, to rid the land of all that, that God said to get rid of. If they do everything that God said to do, like they were 100% obedient, does that put it on them or does that put it on God? Does that mean that God gave them all of that or does that mean they gave it they garnered it from themselves i think it's very very clear that if god said do a b c d e and f and they do a b c d e and f that that is all god that god is the one providing for them god is giving them everything and so we come to the new testament and god says if you do a b c d and e I will save you. And we do A, B, C, D, and E. And God saves us. That is God saving us. And there are people, I'm, ta I'm talking to one, I've been talking to one the last couple of days, that says, if God says do A, B, C, D, E, and I will save you, and you do A, B, C, D, and E, that's you saving yourself. It's it's utterly ridiculous to, to say that because I'm doing what God told me to do, that I somehow believe I'm saving myself. 
I don't believe that at all. And there's nobody in the Church of Christ that believes they saved themselves. Not one person believes that they saved themselves. Every single person I know of that has any kind of maturity or knowledge within the Church of Christ believes that God does the saving. We are saved by grace. It is, it is God, 100%, that saves us. But God has chosen to save us through obedient faith. And that doesn't mean that we can do the things that God said to do and then boast about it. Yeah, God, I believed you. That's on me. I repented of my sins. Look how awesome I am. I confessed my faith in Christ. Man, I am I am the bomb. And man, did you see the way I went down into that water and came up a new creature? Yeah, I, that, that was all me saving myself. You know how stupid that sounds? That's ridiculous. God said, you do it my way and I will save you. And when we do it God's way, we trust that God does the saving. Me believing the Bible isn't me saving myself. Me repenting of my sins isn't me saving myself. Me confessing my faith in Christ and going down into the water, trusting that God brings me into the contact with the blood of his son, destroys the old man and brings me up a new creature isn't me trusting in myself and believing that I save myself. And if you don't get that, then you're being willfully ignorant and you're misrepresenting the church of Christ. And that's what I've told this guy. He's, he's a former member. I don't think he ever understood, but he was there for five minutes and then he got pulled away into denominationalism and he's now accusing and, and he doesn't get it. He's misrepresenting 100%. You guys believe you save yourself. This is Moses telling them, when you come into the land and you do all of these things that God has, has given you to do, and, and he blesses you for doing them, and you come to this place, rejoice. But remember to give God the glory because it's God doing it. It's not you doing it. You are going in to conquer the land because God said so, and you are going to succeed in conquering the land because God is the one doing the conquering. It's all God in that sense. You're just trusting him. The way you didn't trust him 40 years ago when the last generation sent the spies in. That was not trusting. And then verse 8, You shall not do after all the things that we do here this day, every man whatsoever is right in his own eyes. For you are not as yet come to the rest and to the inheritance which Jehovah your God has given you. In other words, we're not we're not going to be out here in the wilderness. We're not going to do the same the things the same way. Out here, things were a little bit different because of where we are and when we weren't in the land yet, and things had to be a little bit different. The tabernacle was a big part of that. But we're going to go into the land that God promised you, and, and all of the things that were set up for you to do when you got to the land. That's when you start doing those things. When you go over Jordan and dwell in the land which Jehovah your God gives you to inherit, and when he gives you rest from all your enemies round about, so that you dwell in safety, that's when the peace comes, then there shall be a place which Jehovah your God shall choose to cause his name to dwell there. There you shall bring all that I command you, your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes, the heave offering of your hand, and all your choice vows which you vow unto Jehovah. So they were in, a, in the peace time, they would get a, a temple, and they were to do all of their worshiping, bring all their sacrifices there. And you shall rejoice. They should celebrate. It's joyful before Jehovah your God, you and your sons and your daughters, and your men servants and your maidservants, and the Levite that is within your gates, for as much as he has no part nor inheritance with you, that they get to be part of the land promise. Take heed to yourself that you offer not any uh, or not, offer not thy burnt offerings in every place that you see. So could they, could they worship anywhere? No, they had to worship in the place that God was going to set up for them. But in the place which Jehovah shall choose in one of your tribes, there you shall offer your burnt offerings, and there you shall do all that I command you. It's very clear. And again, this is the type pointing to the church. You can't just worship where you choose. You have to worship where God chooses. Jesus built one church. Matthew 16, 18. Uh, uh, upon this rock, the rock that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the God, uh, the, the Son of God. Upon that rock, Jesus said, "I will build my church." Singular. There's only one. 
That's the one he chose. He only has one bride. He's not a polygamist. He married one bride. And if we bring our offering, our life, a living sacrifice, to that one church, then we will worship God in spirit and truth. If you will try to do it any other way, you're not. Notwithstanding, you may kill and eat flesh in all your gates, whatsoever your soul lusts. Remember, they've been eating manna this whole time. They brought their herds and their cattle and all that for the sacrifices and everything that they were required to do. But they've only been eating the manna and drinking the water. And then there was that one time with a quail that didn't go so well. Okay? But you can kill and eat flesh in all your gates. Whatsoever your soul desires, lusts after, that, that's that strong desire. According to the blessing of Jehovah your God, which he give, hath given you. The unclean and the clean may eat thereof uh, as of the roebuck and as of the heart. So the animals are going to eat what they want. Okay? Um, and then in terms of the unclean, this is the Gentile and the clean. Okay, remember they had some sojourners with them. They can eat uh, as of the roebuck and as of the heart. Um, they can eat all of the things that they, that they desire within the gates. Um, according to as God has commanded them. Of course, they had their, their dietary laws that they had to keep those. But only you shall not eat the blood. You shall pour it on earth, on, on the earth or on the ground as water. Um, that was a, a very strong commandment. Of course, that was typifying the idea of, of the blood of Christ, that life is found in the blood. So they were not allowed to eat the blood. <clears throat> you may not eat within your gates the tithe of your corn or thy wine or of thy oil, or the first things of your herd or your flock, nor any of the vows which you vow, nor your free will offering or heave offering of your hand. Okay, so they can't eat those wherever they want to. Remember, they, they had to bring the the firstlings of their flock. Go back to Adam and, and I mean, uh, Cain and Abel. Uh, Cain didn't bring the firstlings. Abel did. He brought the fat, the best, the first. They need to bring the, 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 the best of the land, the fat of the land, the firstlings of their, their crops and their, their herds every year before God. And then the worship, in, in particular those things, before God at the location that he chooses. Everything else they can eat wherever they want to. But they can't do that with, with these um, sacrificial things. They had to bring those specifically to the temple. But you must eat them before Jehovah your God in the place which Jehovah your God shall choose you and your son and your daughter and your manservant and your maidservant and the Levite that is within your gates. And you shall rejoice. That's the third time he said that in this context. You shall rejoice before Jehovah your God in all that you put your hands to. So again, they're going to bring these sacrifices in remembrance that God is doing all of this for them. But then he says, you shall rejoice in all the things that you do. Nobody here should be thinking that this is all about the Israelites and the things that the Israelites are doing and it's all about the Israelites. No, this is about God and the things that God is doing for Israel. But that doesn't diminish the requirement and the association with them having to do these things. They have to keep the commandments and it doesn't change in the New Testament. In terms of uh, the, the law changes, the details change, but the, but the principle of God commands it and you have to do it. And then God gets the glory and, and the, he gets the, the honor and, and the responsibility and the respect of, uh, he's the one that did it. You obey because God said to obey. That's all there is to it. Take heed to yourself that you do not forsake the Levite as long as you live upon the earth. So as long as you're in this land, don't forget the Levites. They didn't do that the entire the entire time. Remember, when they talk about the northern tribes and the southern tribes, Judah and Benjamin, they're not the only two tribes. The Levitical priesthood still remains. They don't get mentioned because they don't have a land inheritance. But who were um, mentioned in the New Testament as still being around? Who was John the Immersure uh, of the tribe of? Elizabeth. Who was she a member of the tribe of? Mary was a member of both Levi and Judah. And she was a cousin of Elizabeth. And um, you have uh, the Caiaphas and Ananias. And these guys were still all Levitical priesthood. Still around. And so these guys were, were taken care of. The, the religion centered around taking care of them. So that they could remind the people of 
what they were supposed to be there for, which was to bring Messiah into the world. That's what all those sacrifices were to do, to point to Christ, because that was their that was their whole reason for existing was to bring Messiah Messiah into the world. Okay. <clears throat> But Jehovah your God shall enlarge your border as he has promised you. And you shall say, I will eat flesh because your soul longs to eat flesh. You may eat flesh whatsoever your soul desires after. If the place which Jehovah your God has chosen to put his name there be too uh, far from you, then you shall kill of your herd and of your flock which Jehovah has given you as I have commanded, and you shall eat in your gates whatsoever your soul lusts after. Even as the roebuck and the heart is eaten, so then shall eat them. The unclean and the clean shall eat of them alike. That's the, the Gentile and the Jew. Um, he says if, if it's too far for you to do what you're supposed to do, he's given them, like, okay, this is how you're going to handle it. We'll see more of this in chapter 14. Then um, you can uh, sell it, turn it into money, bring it, and then buy uh, because that kind of represents, that money represents the firstlings, the fat, the best. And then you can buy those to at the at the place, at the temple uh, there in Jerusalem. You can buy those and you can uh, sac make sacrifices of that there. That's, that's what's going to come up in, in Deuteronomy 14. And so he says, you can, you can eat what you want. You can eat meat, because I know you guys have been 40 years, you haven't eaten any meat, because <laughs> you've been eating manna this whole time. It says, uh, <clears throat> even as the roebuck and the heart is eaten, so the, thou shalt eat them. The unclean and the clean shall eat of them alike. Only be sure that you eat not of the blood, for the blood is the life, and you may not eat the life with flesh. Okay, so that the blood there is, is a big deal. Again, because the blood typifies, the blood typifies the blood that was shed by Jesus. And that it's, it's pointing forward to that. And we see... Um, this brought forward into uh, like Acts chapter 15. Uh, they were to abstain from blood. They told the Gentiles, you, you don't have to keep the law of Moses, but you do need to stay away from the things sacrificed to idols, strangled things, um, the, the blood and stuff, because that was associated with a pagan worship. But there's actually not a, a general command under the New Testament to abstain from eating blood. Um, because there's no more pointer, there's no more types pointing forward to anything. It's all in Christ Jesus already. And so uh, Acts chapter 15, of course, we could talk about that another time. But um, here, they couldn't eat of the blood because of it, what it pointed to, uh, pointing to in the New Testament. So you should not eat it. You should pour it upon the earth as water. You should not eat it that it may go well with you and with the children after you, when you shall do that which is right in the sight of Jehovah. Only your holy things which you have, and your vows, you shall take and go into the place which Jehovah shall choose. And you shall offer your burnt offerings, the flesh and the blood, upon the altar of Jehovah your God. And the blood of your sacrifices shall be poured out upon the altar of Jehovah your God, and you shall eat the flesh. Observe and hear all these words which I command you, that it may go well with you and with the children after you forever. How long was forever? All of these sacrifices were going to end. All these handwriting and ordinances that Moses is, is saying to them right now, and Joshua is, is writing as furiously as he can, when did these end? Colossians 2.14, Ephesians 2.15, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that were against us. These are those. When did their forever end? Their forever ended at the cross. The handwriting of ordinances were nailed to the cross. They're forever ended at the cross. I've already, I have a separate video that talks about forever. Uh, you can look it up under my YouTube channel. Okay, so they're, they're going to observe and hear all of these so that it will go well with them forever. In other words, for the entire time that God had allotted them until Messiah came. When you do that which is good and right in the sight of Jehovah your God, and he's, he's saying that over and over and over again, Jehovah your God, Jehovah your God, Jehovah your God, of course, the the Israelites, the rabbinical traditions, in, in an effort not to stain the name of God like that could even happen, um, changed the name of God into Lord and wouldn't write or say the name. Even today, if you talk to somebody who claims to be Jew, they won't say, they won't even say God. They'll put a dash in there, G-D, because somehow that's his name, I guess. Um, 
but it's actually Jehovah. He wants his name out there. He says it over and over again. Moses is saying it over and over again. When, when Joshua is writing these down, he's actually writing Yeshua over and over and over again. Jehovah is the God that we're supposed to worship. Yahweh, if you want to do, to do the, the Old Testament pronunciation or, or whatever. There's no problems with translations. But over and over and over again, you see Jehovah being written and said in this context. And we should be doing the same thing. We should identify the specific God that we worship to distinguish him as the one true living God instead of all these fake false gods. Uh, I don't know why people don't want to do that. And you shall eat the flesh. Observe and hear all these words which I command you, that it may go well with you and with your children uh, after thee forever, when you do that which is good and right in the sight of Jehovah your God. When Jehovah your God shall cut off the nations from before you, whether, whether you go to possess them, and you succeed them and dwell in their land, take heed to yourself that you be not snared by following them, after that they be destroyed from before you, and that you inquire not after their gods, saying, How did these nations serve their gods? Even so will I do likewise. God says, once you go in and you wipe these guys out, and you take out all of their fake false gods and their false religions, once you have been successful in doing that, don't get curious. Don't dig into it, and don't don't try to figure it out and, and try to understand them. Just eradicate them. There isn't any usefulness at all in understanding the fake things that, that, that man has come up with to worship. There's only one true living God. And when you do that which is right, it's easy to reject what's wrong. For me, and, and I know this has been said by many, many people before me, um, but I don't have to learn. Um, I, in fact, I think I heard it about a week ago or so. Um, the guys that do counterfeit money, that, that, that are in the anti-counterfeiting uh, government branch or whatever, they don't have to learn all the fake, false ways that money can be counterfeited. They don't have to go memorize all of the, the false ways. All they have to do is learn to identify the true one. And you, once you learn to identify the true one, anything that doesn't match up to that is false, by definition. And so God says, learn the true religion. Learn the true commandments that I'm giving you. And don't go exploring all these false fake ones. There's no reason to do that. Know the true and the false makes itself evident. And that's true today. We learn the faith that was once and for all delivered to the saints. We learn the one faith of Ephesians 4. Uh, and, and we learn the one way that God has taught us. Everything else is man-made and worthy of the fire. It's false, fake, vain, empty, useless, worthy of destruction. And I keep harping on that. I keep hitting, I keep hitting on that. And the reason I do that is because there are millions of people, and that's not hyperbole, there's millions of people who approach the Bible and have their own way of doing it. And, and it's not just that they, they've made a mistake and they don't understand something and they need to grow. It's that they accept the very idea that there's multiple ways. There's only one way. It's straight and narrow. There's only one way. And only a few people are going to, unfortunately, be, be the ones to find it. Because everybody else is like, well, I can just go to heaven however I want to. And God says, no, you learn my way and don't go after these others. You shall not do so unto Jehovah your God for every abomination to Jehovah which he hates have they done unto their gods. Why don't you fall after these gods? Because everything they do is an abomination to him. Listen up. Denominations of the world of today, those of you who think you're worshiping God the right way, you're not. You're worshiping God in a false way, and your worship is vain and an abomination to him. Because it's your arrogance thinking that you can do it your way instead of God's way. Oh, it's okay, I'll just add a piano. It's okay, I'll just add a rock band. It makes me feel good. I got this warm fuzzy. It just makes me feel good to go in and, and, and to speak in tongues so that everybody's paying attention to me. 
or I'm gonna I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna I'm gonna have a, a clergy system to be like the the Levitical priesthood of the Old Testament, and we're gonna set up a guy at the very top. And we're gonna call him the Vicar of Christ. That's what we think is is the way that we should do it. Not in the Bible. None of that. None of that is in the Bible. Miracles passed away. It's the only only guys that have any. Uh, legitimacy at all in terms of looking at the scripture, but Paul says those things would pass away when when the Bible was fully delivered. That was the first century. All of the rest of it, can't even find it. Can't find pianos, can't find rock bands, can't find a pope, can't find any of that. It's all man-made stuff, and it's all an abomination to God because it's all arrogance. Especially those of you who are teaching that 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 when a child is conceived, they're conceived as a monster, as an evil, sinful, disgusting, degenerate filth that's only worthy of Gehenna. That's abomination to God. That is that is the most vile thing. It's it's as bad as the abortionist. Because and it's worse because it's on the spiritual level rather than just the physical. That's what God says. Don't go after these false religions because every abomination to Jehovah, which he hates, have they done unto their gods. For even their sons and their daughters they have burnt in the fire to their gods. Child sacrifice is an abomination to God. Go back to Abraham. Go back to Isaac. When, when Abraham is going to offer Isaac the only un way to understand that properly is God never intended for Abraham to do that. God only intended to show Abraham how strong his faith was and that he was going to provide a stand-in, a stand-in somebody to take the place of Isaac, to typify Jesus Christ standing in for all of us. But actual child sacrifice is an abomination to God. When we get into the book of Judges and we talk about Jephthah and his daughter, if you try to understand that, that Jephthah actually took his daughter to an altar and killed her to sacrifice her to God because God gave him the win, you aren't understanding. That is abomination to God and he does not accept it. Under any circumstances, and there's no contradictions with God, and then he ends up here, and this is this is this is kind of a culmination of what I've been saying tonight. What things soever I command you, observe to do it. You shall not add thereto, nor to diminish from it. God has one way. You can't add anything to it, and you can't take anything away from it. If you add stuff to it, that's your arrogance. That's you serving yourself. If you take away from it, that's your arrogance, thinking that you know better than God. You do it God's way, or you die. You do it God's way, or you're worthy of destruction. There's only one way. And anybody who's adding to what God said, whether it's pianos or, or bands or priesthoods or... Uh, all, all of the, the clergy laity system or, or uh, modern miracles and, and what have you adding those things is, is wrong it, it goes against what God has said and it, it is absolute arrogance and then diminishing taking from it oh you don't have to be immersed in water to be saved that's taking away from God's word because God said baptism doth also now save you it's very clear it's right there in black and white super easy to understand you have to work to get it wrong Romans chapter 6 absolutely clear that baptism is necessary for salvation it's the point that you're put into Christ it's the point that you become a new creature it's the point that you're freed from sin all of that absolutely clear in Romans chapter 6 but people say we don't have to be immersed to be saved they're diminishing from the word of God and when they do that when they take away from the word of God when they alter it they're preaching another gospel and they're worthy of destruction. Galatians 1, 6 through 9, they're an abomination, an anathema. And th the Bible doesn't pull punches on that, and neither am I. It's very, very clear that God says, do it my way. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a place to build my habitation, the representation of where I dwell on the earth. 
among you. And when you build that, you can only worship here and you can only worship the way I told you to do. New Testament is the same way. I'm going to build my church. I'm going to build my temple. And you have to worship there. You have to be in it. And there's only one way in it. And that's to be washed by the blood of my son. And the only place you can do that is through baptism. You have to believe the gospel, repent of your sins, confess your faith in Christ, and then you can be baptized into Christ to become part of this temple, one of the building blocks of this temple. And there you have to worship me the way I say, not the way that you say. It, it, it's absolutely clear. It, it, I, I don't understand. It, it boggles my mind how people miss this. And I say that of people who read these passages and study them and, and, and actually understand them. I do get how people don't get it when all they do is they sit in their pew on Sunday and they listen to the guy up in the pulpit. If that's all you're doing, you're not being faithful. You're not studying the word for yourself. If you're just listening to me, if you're watching these videos and that's all you do, you're doing it wrong. Get your Bible out, read it for yourself, study for yourself, and understand it for yourself. I'm not anybody. I don't even claim direct indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit dwells in me through the Word. I'm fallible. I can get it wrong. I have made mistakes even in these videos that I've produced. I've realized I've had to go back and, and, and correct things that I've said. And I'm only in the first five books. Don't look at me or any other man as authority. Jesus Christ is the authority. So if you're not studying your Bible and doing it for yourself, you're doing it wrong. And you need to, you, you need to communicate with God directly. You need to be listening to what he's saying to you by reading the scripture. Faith comes by hearing the word of God, not hearing the word of that dude up in the pulpit. Because he's not any more or, or less powerful than you in being able to understand God's message to you. That's the chapter. I'm going to kind of leave it there. Um, I hope there's comments. I hope there's discussion. Um, I know some are going to watch this and, and have some things to say, uh, especially when I get off into the, the political side of things. But, um, you know, discuss those things. Tell me, tell me where I'm wrong. Show me from the scriptures that I'm wrong. Um, but if you liked it, you know, share it, get the word out. Let's, let's, let's study this together with more people, get as many people as we can studying the Bible together and, and get as many as we can to heaven. But, um, appreciate you tuning in. Um, as always, I enjoy these studies. Um, I, I get to as many as I can when I can. Um, I'm grateful for having spring break this week. Um, I've been able to get several videos done this week because of that. I'm probably going to get back down to about two a week, uh, moving forward. We'll have to see. But um, thank you for joining me. Um, my name is Ernie Lawrence. This has been another Swordmaster Publications presentation. And uh, we'll see you guys next time.